afraid because we want order. We can't deal with the confusion and the disorder. disorder. We want form. We want rules. But chaos is basically good. Relax, surf the ways of chaos, and learn how to redesign your own realities. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Poor Man's Chemist. Well, well, well. Who's teacher now? Yeah. Who's teacher? In this video, I am going to make good on a long-standing promise, and I am going to review the characterization of the synthesis of NN dimethyltryptamine by reductive amination using gas chromatography ion trap mass spectrometry. Now, before we go any further, I have to say this to cover my ass. This video is purely for educational purposes. I am not trying to encourage or condone anybody breaking the law for any reason whatsoever. If you choose to take this information and misuse it, that is 100% on you. I wash my hands of you. I, I mean, that's, that's your responsibility. I am telling you now, do not do this thing, okay? Another thing I want to point out before we get started is that I'm not going to cover every single little word of this paper because there are some parts of this paper that are focused on the more technical aspects of the analytical instrumentation that was used. We have not discussed any of these instrumental analytical methods in any of the organic lectures yet, uh, except for IR spec, but we haven't covered NMR and we certainly haven't talked about liquid chromatography or gas chromatography or mass spectroscopy. We will at some point, but because of that, I am going to skip those parts of the paper. Besides, I don't know that they would really be meaningful or helpful to anybody that didn't own their own GCMS, and if you do, you don't need me to explain it to you. Now that we've got the preliminary shit out of the way, let's take a look at the abstract, which for the two people out there that don't know that, is just a short summary of what the paper talks about. The present study established an impurity profile of a synthetic route to the hallucinogenic NN dimethyltryptamine, which hereafter is abbreviated DMT. The synthesis was carried out under reductive amination conditions between tryptamine and aqueous formaldehyde in the presence of acetic acid, followed by reduction with sodium cyanoborohydride. Now, stop. Stop typing. Okay? Hundreds to thousands of miles away, and all this way back in the past, I can feel you starting to type, You don't need sodium cyanoborohydride, you can use triacid oxyborohydride. Yes, we, we know, okay? The paper is even going to talk about that. Just sit tight, relax. Analytical characterization of this synthetic route was carried out by gas chromatography, ion trap, mass spectrometry, God, I hate that word, using electron and chemical ionization modes. Methanol was employed as a liquid chemical ionization reagent, and the impact of stoichiometric modifications on side product formation was also investigated. What they mean there when they're talking about liquid chemical ionization reagent, that's pertaining to the instrumental method that they use. Don't worry about that part. The various compounds that were detected, depending on the reaction conditions that they used, were number one, tryptamine the starting material. Number two, DMT, what they were after. Number three, two methyl tetrahydrobetacarboline. Number four, N-methyl and cyanomethyl tryptamine, a very weird compound that so far as I can find does not seem to occur in nature. Number five, N-methyl tryptamine. Number six, two cyanomethyl tetrahydrobetacarboline. Another one that I cannot find any mention of occurring in nature. And tetrahydrobetacarboline itself. Replacement of formaldehyde solution with paraformaldehyde resulted in incomplete conversion of the starting material. So don't do that. Whereas a similar replacement of sodium cyanoborohydride with sodium borohydride almost exclusively produced tetrahydrobetacarboline 
instead of the expected DMT. I don't know who is expecting to get DMT out of that, but apparently there are people that expected that. Compounds 1 to 7 were quantified, and the limits of detection were a series of numbers, respectively. They're in order 1 to 7. I'm not going to read every number. What's important to notice here is the concentrations. Note that they are all given in nanograms per milliliter. The limits of quantification for compounds 1 to 7 were another very similar series of numbers, but these are all in micrograms per milliliter. So all of these are very close to being a thousand-fold higher than the limit of detection. Well, why can't you quantify it if you can detect it, you may ask. The next sentence tells us, Linearity was observed in the range of 20.8 to 980 micrograms per mil, with correlation coefficients greater than 0.99. Now, unless you've taken analytical chem and instrumental methods, you may not know this, but you cannot get any kind of meaningful measurement um, doing an instrumental analysis like this unless the response for the range of concentrations that you're looking at from the instrument is linear. So your calibration curve has to be a straight line that slopes upwards as you go from sample, you know, lower concentration to ones of higher concentrations. Once you get to concentrations that are lower than that or higher than that, the response from the instrument is no longer linear. And so you can no longer use those results to um, get quantification, uh, you know, of the sample itself. There's no way to tell how much of your analyte is there. In fact, at that point, the, the um, analysis isn't really telling you anything meaningful. So, handy little tidbit of information. The application holds great promise in the area of forensic chemistry, where development of reliable analytical methods for the detection, identification, and quantification of DMT are crucial. And also in pharmaceutical analysis, where DMT might be prepared for use in human clinical studies. As you may have picked up on, the second reason actually has redeeming virtues, and the first one does not. Um, given that DMT is a basically a harmless compound, except for weak-minded people that use it and lose their shit because they're dumb enough to react to a hallucination. <sighs> Your people are ruining it for everybody. Anyway... Um, yeah, no. The, the, the reason that they emphasize the, um, the forensic chemistry reason first is because the name of the journal that this paper is published in is Drug Testing and Analysis, and because these four people that wrote this paper are extremely self-serving that do not care um, how many otherwise basically innocent people are chucked into the corporate prison system because the judicial system does not deal with um, you know running prisons or parole or probation management that is all done by private billion dollar corporations um, so this is a wonderful example of the banality of evil um, you know kind of like you know a clerk that worked in the offices of the SS or the Gestapo they weren't the ones going out and fucking people up they just did shit to enable other people to go out and fuck people up um so yeah that's my editorial about that moving on all right so starting with the introduction here some of this is fluff but it is full of a lot of useful tidbits of information so here we go many bioactive compounds are structurally based on the tryptamine nucleus although tryptamine itself does not appear to be active in man a variety of simple modifications give rise to a large number of psychoactive derivatives. One such derivative is NN dimethyltryptamine. DMT shows hallucinogenic properties when either inhaled as the free base or when, for example, injected intravenously as the appropriate salt. I know that that has been done before in some studies on DMT. Jesus Christ, that must be a fucking ride. In order to render DMT orally active, co-administration of a suitable monoamine oxidase A inhibitor is required. Note, monoamine oxidase A. DMT is a Schedule I drug that is abundantly available in the plant kingdom. It can also be easily prepared by a variety of synthetic routes. Increased availability of drug-related information on the internet 
you don't say, really, on the internet. And the fact that DMT is able to induce powerful altered states of consciousness in humans resulted in increased popularity within recreational communities, and, in recent years, it also became a target for intense human clinical studies. The pharmacology of DMT and related derivatives is complex, but current knowledge points towards the involvement of 5-HT2A and 5-HT1 receptor subtypes. 5-HT is serotonin. Recent findings also suggested that DMT served as an agonist at the Sigma-1 receptor. That's an opioid receptor, although not the one that's responsible for opioids' fun properties and that it displayed substrate-like properties at both the plasma membrane serotonin transporter and the vesicle monoamine transporter, respectively. That means that it has been shown to bind to these two transporter proteins. The plasma membrane serotonin transporter transports serotonin from the synapse back into the cell, and the vesicle monoamine transporter transports various monoamine neurotransmitters into the vesicles to be released into the synapse. A large number of synthetic routes can be used for the preparation of DMT and structurally related anti-migraine tryptan derivatives. A commonly used synthetic route for large-scale preparation of DMT derivatives involves the reductive amination between formaldehyde and the tryptamine starting material in acidic media, often carried out in methanol. A reducing agent, often sodium cyanoborohydride, enables the reduction of an intermediate amine or aminium salt. This traditionally used formaldehyde sodium cyanoborohydride acetic acid methanol system has also been used for the synthesis of tryptan type anti-migraine compounds that are also derivatives of DMT, but formation of impurities was not reported. The identification of potentially toxic and route-specific byproducts is of fundamental importance when preparing pharmaceutical ingredients or products for human clinical studies, either by characterization of the bulk drug or by implementation of stability-indicating methodologies. Gas chromatography mass spectrometry has been commonly employed for the successful detection of DMT in a large variety of bioanalytical or plant matrices. Examples include investigations on DMT metabolism in whole rat brain homogenates and detection in DMT containing plant, i.e. ayahuasca, extracts. And whole rat brain homogenate is exactly like it sounds. It's a rat brain that's been blended up into a homogenous mix. Alright, after this, the introduction doesn't really say anything that's all that's useful. Um, the next couple of paragraphs are pure filler, where the authors basically repeat themselves over and over again. I mean, you guys have got the DOI of the paper in the description. You can go and download this thing. Look in, you don't believe me? Look at those last couple paragraphs and you will see that I speak the truth. Also, that these authors are not very good writers. The final paragraph is would be just a rehash of stuff we talked about when we read the abstract, so I'm not going to read that again. Now, that brings us to the experimental section. Yay! We have gotten through the fluff and picked out all the useful information from that. Now let's get into the real meat and potatoes of this shit. Now, under the experimental, the first section that they have is the materials, and, and then there's the instrumentation section. These are not very important for us. The materials, it just says where they got all of the reagents, that they were all HPLC grade, analytical grade, or the equivalent. In other words, they were all very high purity. Under the instrumentation, they tell you how they set up all of the instruments Unless you are going to be doing GCMS of DMT and its analogs, I can't imagine that this would be useful to really to anyone. But the next thing is synthesis procedures. Now that, I think, will get everybody's attention. Okay, so the first synthesis procedure that they give us is the standard reductive amination conditions used for the synthesis of DMT. This is the basic reaction that they tried over and over again, varying the stoichiometries, occasionally changing one reagent for another one that's very similar, and they just saw what was produced. 
So this is the basic procedure that they used. One gram of tryptamine was dissolved in 40 mils of ice cold methanol, followed by the addition of 1.2 milliliters of glacial acetic acid and 629 milligrams of sodium cyanoborohydride. This was left to stir on ice for five minutes. 429 milligrams of a 39% formaldehyde solution in 10 mils of methanol was added dropwise to the reaction mixture over a period of 20 minutes. The ice was removed and the reaction was left to stir for two and a half hours at room temperature. 3 milliliters of 20% sodium hydroxide was added and the solvent was removed under reduced pressure. This was followed by the addition of 20 milliliters of distilled water and three extractions with 20 milliliters of chloroform. Very important, chloroform. The combined organic layers were washed once with 20 mils of water and 20 mils of brine, which is concentrated aqueous sodium chloride, dried with magnesium sulfate, just like we did in the Kratom videos, and filtered. The filter cake was washed twice with two 20 mil portions of chloroform, and the filtrate was evaporated under reduced pressure. The oily residue was dried over phosphorus pentoxide overnight to yield 1.169 grams of a pale brown waxy solid and characterized by GCMS analysis. The standard conditions were then modified to study the impact of varied reagent stoichiometry, and all reactions were carried out in duplicate. Now, before we look at the table that they refer to that tells us the results of changing all the stoichiometries, let's look at the other synthesis procedures they give us real quick. The next synthesis that they give us is for N-methyl N-cyanomethyl tryptamine. This is compound four, that weird one that I can find almost no information about. I have no idea what this shit does. It could be inert. It could be neurotoxic. I have no idea. Anyway, this is how you make it. One gram of N-methyltryptamine was added to a solution of 50 mils of benzene and 820 milligrams of potassium carbonate. 433 milligrams of chloroacetonitrile was then added and the resulting mixture was heated at reflux overnight. The solvent was removed under reduced pressure to give a pale brown solid that was purified by flash chromatography. The other synthesis that they give us is for the other compound that I can find no mention of occurring in nature or ever being used by anyone. This is another one that I have no idea what this would actually do to a person. But here you go. How to synthesize 2-cyanomethyl tetrahydrobeta carboline. So, 860 milligrams of tetrahydrobeta carboline, which is compound 7 in this study, was added to a solution of 1.5 grams of sodium carbonate and 100 mils of benzene. 1.19 grams of chloroacetonitrile was then added and the resulting mixture was heated at reflux for two days. After solvent evaporation, ethanol was added to the residue and heated to the boiling point temperature. After filtration, the ethanol filtrate was reduced in volume under reduced pressure and left to crystallize at 4C to give a white solid. And it looks like the yield pretty much sucks. Alright, before we get into the results and discussion, let's take a look at the table that summarizes all of their results. So you can see that they tried nine different sets of reaction conditions, and you can see the various molar equivalents of the reagents that they used. S stands for tryptamine, FA is formaldehyde, A is acetic acid, and RA is the reducing agent, in this case sodium cyanoborohydride, except for reaction nine, where they used regular old sodium borohydride. Reaction 8 is where they use paraformaldehyde instead of formaldehyde. And you can see the results that they get. Now one thing that I'm sure everybody's probably already noticed by now, Reaction 3 is the best set of conditions that could be used. The highest yield of DMT with the lowest amount of contaminating byproducts. Unfortunately, one of those contaminating byproducts is compound 4, which really 
probably should be removed from everything else using preparative chromatography. There's no other way you could separate it out. An acid-base extraction will extract both DMT and compound 4. They will behave identically. Only preparative chromatography can separate these two things. All of the other reaction conditions that they used were eh, not as good. Reaction 5 was not too bad, but everything else pretty much sucks. Alright, that brings us to the results and discussion section. Inspection of GC ITMS traces revealed that DMT was formed under all conditions where sodium cyanoborohydride was used as the reducing agent. As a starting point, the adopted set of standard reductive amination conditions was based on synthetic pathways found in the published literature. So their standard protocol was something that they took from the literature. They did not devise it. A number of different solvents were discussed in these articles when considering the workup. Hint, hint, this is really important. Solvents discussed included ethyl acetate and dichloromethane. In designing the present study, it was decided to use chloroform instead of ethyl acetate or dichloromethane because preliminary experiments revealed that the use of ethyl acetate as the extraction solvent gave poor product yields. The use of DCM was discarded because it has been shown previously that DCM reacts with DMT during the extraction process. The result would have been the formation of additional impurities unrelated to this synthetic route. Chloroform was selected because it is a common solvent that is cheap and provides a more effective extraction. This advantage might also attract the interest of the clandestine chemist in order to obtain increased yields and the authors redeemed themselves a little bit. Once the standard conditions were applied, it was deemed necessary to gain further insights in the extent of DMT and byproduct formation when exposed to varied reagent stoichiometry. I have my doubts as to the veracity of that statement because if you work with Schedule 1s, you have to submit a plan to the DEA in advance. You have to account for every single milligram of material I don't think that they just did the first prep and then, hey, let's try changing the stoichiometry around. That is not how any of this works. The rationale behind this approach aimed to mimic both a clandestine type situation where access to reagents might be limited, but to also consider the pharmaceutical quality control context in which the identification of route specific impurities present in bulk drugs is also needed. The extent of reagent variation is summarized in Table 1, the table we just looked at, where the equivalent of one of the reagents was either reduced by 50% or increased by 100%, respectively, and that's reactions 2 to 7. In addition, replacement of aqueous formaldehyde with solid paraformaldehyde and sodium cyanoborohydride with sodium borohydride were also carried out in order to gain further insights into the impact of reagent availability on product formation. Product and byproduct yields have been determined in duplicate and the results are summarized in Table 1. Alright, the next two sections are identification of byproducts and calibration and GCMS method validation. Now the identification of byproducts section doesn't really give us any new information and the calibration and GCMS method validation I think is very technical and beyond the scope of our discussion here. But that brings us to the last section that is jam-packed with information, and it is called Formation of Impurities. Now, up until this point, I have been putting the text on the screen, but I am going to put the reaction scheme on the screen because this section is talking about this particular scheme. As you can see, it's a little involved, and so I think having it on the screen will make things easier for you. I have also used my Mad MS Paint skills, and I have gone through and where they just put the compound numbers, I actually put the number and the structure there too, so that you guys wouldn't have to be referring back and forth to other things here, so it's all in one place. So let's do this. 
The proposed reaction pathways to account for the observed products are shown in Figure 4, the scheme on your screen right now. Reaction of the primary or secondary amine with formaldehyde gives an aminol, which dehydrates to give the aminium salt intermediates. The aminium salts are good electrophiles and can react with nucleophiles by three pathways, depending upon the precise reaction conditions. The expected reaction is a fast reduction of the aminium salts to the corresponding amines N-methyltryptamine, which is compound 5, and DMT, which is compound 2. Lowering the equivalence of formaldehyde had the expected effect of lowering the yield of DMT. Duh. This is because formation of DMT required at least two equivalents of formaldehyde. The two methyl groups got to come from somewhere. Lowering the equivalent did not, however, change the yield of tryptamine and N-methyltryptamine. Don't know why you would think that it would. If the reducing agent is at a low concentration or unreactive, then a picket spengler 6 endo trig cyclization reaction of the aminium salt at C2 of the endol ring can occur to give tetrahydrobeta carboline functionality. The formation of tetrahydrobeta carboline itself, compound 7, was observed when sodium borohydride was used as the reducing agent. This can be rationalized by the reaction of the reactive sodium borohydride with formaldehyde to give methanol, preventing both reduction and further reaction with formaldehyde, which is why I said, who the hell expected to get DMT using sodium borohydride? In addition, sodium borohydride will also decompose under the acidic conditions of the reaction to give the less reactive sodium triacid oxyborohydride. So... If you want a higher yield, sodium cyanoborohydride seems to be a better choice. On the other hand, sodium triacid oxyborohydride is not going to give you any of these weird, what they're calling cyano compounds. The cyanide group in an organic compound is actually called a nitrile. I don't know why they keep insisting on calling this cyano. This thing reads like it was written by fucking biochemists. The observed cyanomethyl products, which are number four and number six, are formed by the reaction of the aminium salt intermediates with the cyanide nucleophile. Some free cyanide may be present in the sodium cyanoborohydride. However, it is also known to degrade under acidic conditions to give hydrogen cyanide gas. The cyanomethyl compounds were formed in greater amounts under low acetic acid concentrations where the hydrogen cyanide could form the cyanide nucleophile or under low sodium cyanoborohydride concentration where the reduction would be limited. There is precedence for the reaction of cyanide with an aminium salt derived from a tetrahydrobeta carboline derivative, meaning that this has already been reported in the literature previously. The key synthetic routes that lead to the preparation of tryptamine derivatives can be classified into methods that create the indole nucleus by cyclization and those that start with indole and substituted indoles. A third approach involves the modification of a commonly available starting material that already contains the tryptamine moiety and the one-step reductive amination procedure reported in the present study illustrated such an example. This apparently simple procedure revealed the need for an in-depth characterization as reflected by the number of detected side products. A recent report described the analytical characterization of an alternative one-step synthesis to DMT based on procedures discussed on the internet. DMT was suggested to be prepared from tryptamine, methyl iodide, and benzyl triethyl ammonium chloride sodium hydroxide phase transfer catalyst. Yeah, no. LCMSMS analysis of the products did not lead to the detection of DMT, but NNN trimethyl tryptamonium iodide and 1N methyl TMT were formed instead. A trace of N-methyltryptamine and tryptamine starting material were found to be present as well, which indicated that the reaction did not go to completion. And this is why methyl iodide is a piss-poor reagent to do this reaction. And that, my friends, is it. 
that brings us to the conclusion section, which is just rehashing all of the shit that we've just talked about. I really, really hope you guys liked this video. This was actually a lot of work because I had to go through this thing, you know, line by line and make sure I understood every bit of it. Um, this was a lot more work than you might think that it was. This took me the better part of a week to put together. So really, really hoping people enjoyed it. Um, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't like it, well, give it a thumbs down. Subscribe, comment, share the video. Please for the love of God, donate some money. I'm begging y'all. Please, pretty please, even if it's a few bucks, it would really, really help. I would like to make you guys more videos. I really would, you know, more frequently than like one every two weeks, but I just can't do that unless I have some support. So anyway, until the next video, you guys, I will see you later.